Thank you for standing by and welcome to today's Chimeric Th Therapeutics Program Update webinar. All participants are in a listen-only mode. The format will be a little bit different today. Rather than a formal presentation throughout, we wanted to run a bit of a fireside chat amongst the Chimeric executive team as well. As usual, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions. So please, if you do have one in the audience, feel free to type it in using the Q&A function within Zoom. To kick it off, I'll hand it over to Chimeric Therapeutics CEO and Managing Director, Jennifer Chow. Thanks, Matt. And thank you everybody for taking the time to join us today. As Matt said, we're gonna take this opportunity to do a little bit of a different webinar today. Uh, we actually are all together, our team here, preparing through a strategy meeting for the future. And so felt this was a great opportunity to give you the opportunity to meet more of the team. Uh, just as a advanced notice, we are not planning any new announcements during the course of this webinar. So what we really wanted to do today was take an opportunity to just make sure that we have gone through and updated everybody on all of the progress and announcements that we've made over the last couple months. So I'll just kick it off by highlighting the three technology platforms that we are working on again. CHM 1101, our Chlortoxin CAR-T, which we licensed from the City of Hope Hospital in California. And that is our first-in-class Chlortoxin CAR-T right now being studied in glioblastoma. CHM 2101, our CDH17 CAR-T, which we licensed in 2021 from the University of Pennsylvania. And that again is a first-in-class CDH17 CAR-T for gastrointestinal tumors. And then what we call CHM 0201, which is the foundation of our NK program. And this was licensed from Case Western Reserve University in 2022. And so this is just the high level of the three programs that we and technologies that we're working on. To give you a sense of what's been achieved or what's been uh, released in Q4 of 2023, you see the highlights here. With CHM 1101, we announced the positive phase 1A clinical data and really highlighted the 55% disease control rate of the patients in that trial, the 10-month survival for those patients that achieved disease control, and our excitement at the two patients who actually were able to achieve survival beyond 14 months. Very recently, we've also announced that in the phase 1B clinical trial, which is the Chimeric-sponsored CHM1101 trial, we've dosed the first patient at Sarah Cannon Research Institute in Austin, Texas. So lots of activity with the CHM1101 program. With CHM2101, we were thrilled as a team to be able to announce that the FDA had given us IND clearance so that we can move ahead to clinic with this asset. We plan to look at this asset in a phase 1A clinical trial, and we'll be studying three different types of gastrointestinal tumors, colorectal cancer, gastric cancer, and neuroendocrine tumors as we actually start this trial in 2024. And then we've also made two announcements about our NK platform. Most recently, we announced that the ADVENT AML trial, which is the MD Anderson Clinical uh, Cancer Center, IIT, had submitted and had an abstract accepted for presentation at ASH. And then just days ago, announced the positive preclinical data for CHM 1301, which is really what we call a chlortoxin car and K. And that's really bringing together our chlortoxin car with 0201, our NK platform to really look at the synergies to develop new assets. So with that, one of the things that for those of you that actually joined some of these webinars or have seen me present, you know that I often talk about and very, and you know, not very often don't talk about is the experience and expertise of the team at Chimeric. And certainly small team that has incredible experience in this space, working across multiple different types of programs and on four of the six FDA approved CAR T cell therapies. I am thrilled to be able to introduce you to all of them today here on the screen. So what I'm gonna do is I am actually going to stop sharing slides and start sharing video. And I am going to take you through introductions of the team here. And then I we're gonna do a bit of a Q&A with the team. We certainly have some questions that we have prepared around the different platforms, but certainly feel free to add into the investor webinar question or chat additional questions and Matt will feed those through as well. 
So I will start sitting right beside me here, and, and you probably recognize many of these from the pictures you've seen. Sitting right beside me is Elliot Burke. Elliot is our Chief Business Officer and Head of External Innovation. And Elliot's background is Elliot comes both from Celgene BMS and from Kite as well, so lots of experience in this space. Sitting beside Elliot, many of you have probably had the opportunity to see or hear from our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Jason Litton, before. Dr. Litton was on recent uh, webinars with uh, the ADVENT AML trial, introducing the ADVENT AML trial, and most recently talking about the positive phase 1A clinical data with 1101. Uh, sitting beside Dr. Litton are two people that you probably have not had the opportunity to meet for, before. The first is Kelly Thornburg. Kelly Thornburg is our acting head of technical operations and expert in all things quality. And so Kelly actually comes to us from Kite and prior to that many years from Amgen. And then last but not least, rounding us out on this side is Dr. Stephanie Astro. Dr. Astro heads up all of our translational programs and we are thrilled to have her with us as she has a lot of experience working on these therapies, both from Kite and from Fate, Fate Therapeutics. So with that, I am now going to do the Q&A and I'm going to direct questions at them around our programs, but certainly invite you to add additional questions. I am actually gonna start by talking about CHM 1101, chlorotox and CAR-T, and the most recent results that we saw about a month ago that were positive phase 1A clinical trial results. And maybe Jason ask you a little bit about what has the feedback been since that data has become public and, and the results, what's it been like? Yeah, the feedback's actually been really, really positive. Um, I've gotten a lot of outreach directly from physicians that are interested in being a part of the clinical trial program. But maybe even more compellingly, I've received outreach from patients and their caregivers that are really interested in learning more about this study and how they might be able to become involved as well. So that really brings it down to earth for us all and, and reminds us why we're working on these important medicines. Thanks, Jason. One of the questions when this data came out, and Stephanie, I'll maybe direct this towards you, was we know that 55% of patients actually achieved disease control, but obviously 45% did not. Is there anything that we know about who's going to respond to this therapy and who is not, and any work that we might be doing around being able to work that out? Yeah, thanks, Jen. There's not an obvious biomarker for the program, but we're actively collecting data in the translational programs and using a number of different tests to do that, and we're expecting that we'll synthesize that data and perhaps will emerge some predictive markers. Perfect. Thank you. So more to come on that story Certainly. in the future. All right, Jason, back to you. As we've moved from the positive phase 1A data and started talking more about the 1B program and Sarah Cannon, we've looked at the announcement that the first patient in that clinical trial has been dosed. And part of that announcement actually highlighted the fact that that first patient was a second line patient. Can you actually talk a little bit about why that's important and the thinking behind that? Yeah, I'm happy to. So we know that patients derive the most benefit from therapies that they receive for brain cancer um, the sooner they receive them in their treatment regimen. So uh, patients that have only received the standard frontline treatment um, prior to receiving um, CHM 1101 would actually be expected to derive more benefit from patients that have received multiple lines of prior therapy. Um, as Jen mentioned, the, this first patient um, had only received upfront therapy for their disease, and therefore we're, we're hoping that we can provide a really durable benefit for this patient and other patients that are just coming off of standard therapy. And maybe just building on that, Jason, when you're thinking about the phase 1B trial, right, and as we move forward and progress that, what are the most important things that you're going to be looking for? And, and I will ask this on behalf of the question I often get asked when I, when I am presenting in Australia is, can our investors expect to see us share more data than was shared on the phase 1A program yeah. with this program? 
Sure. Um, so first, what we're looking to, to demonstrate initially from the first patients treated in the 1B trial is that we can actually take the learnings from the founding institution, the academic center where the study was initially engaged, and bring it to a multi-center trial and demonstrate the feasibility of the program and delivering this medicine to patients more broadly. Uh, once we demonstrate that we can do that, we'll obviously be looking to build off of those signals of efficacy that they saw at City of Hope and, and hopefully deliver even more compelling signals of efficacy. And yes, I'm very happy to say that in this chimeric sponsored trial, we look forward to providing updates on a, a frequent basis. That's great. Thank you, Jason. Lots of people will be happy to hear that. <laughs> So I'm gonna turn now and I'm gonna talk a little bit about CHM 2101, the CDH17 CAR-T. Lots of excitement recently when we were able to announce that the FDA had provided us clearance on our IND that allows us to be opening the phase 1A clinical trial in 2024. So maybe Elliot, you know, I'd be interested in your thoughts. Why do you think it's so that program is so exciting? Well, it's incredibly exciting, I think not only for Chimeric, but also for patients and for the entire medical and, and scientific community. Uh, so first and foremost, the foundation that this program is built on with the phenomenal preclinical data that we've seen uh, really gives us uh, great hope for, uh, for the, the potential activity this therapy could achieve. Um, but also for patients, uh, as Jason mentioned, uh, we hear monthly, if not weekly or daily from patients and caregivers who are keen for this study to open. Uh, because there just truly are not enough options available for treatment for patients with advanced GI cancers. And, and lastly, for the field, this is a first-in-class CAR T cell therapy against CDH17. This, uh, we think it's going to be the first time that the field is going to see how this therapy and this target could potentially benefit patients with GI cancers. And we know that for many of the larger companies that we've been in discussions with over long periods of time for business development, that they're keenly following this program. Uh, so very excited to see this move forward into the clinic. So that's perfect, Elliot. I think you gave us six or seven reasons to be excited about this program. So hopefully building everybody's anticipation as we move this towards the clinic. One of the things that we have to do, Kelly, to be able to get this into the clinic and be able to treat patients is make sure we're manufacturing ready. And manufacturing ready, if you're talking about an antibiotic or something, might mean one thing, but with cell therapies, manufacturing really means something else entirely. Can you give us a little bit of, of an idea of what that really entails and why manufacturing ready is actually a major milestone with cell therapy development? Yeah, sure, Jen, thanks. Um, you know, individualized CAR-T therapy manufacturing is exceedingly complex. And so as part of our, our clinical manufacturing readiness program, we're gonna be working with the clinical sites, the contract manufacturers and logistics providers to ensure that every piece of the, the journey of those cells as they go through the process is really um, robust and that we can you know, ensure that every, every manufacturing event is a success. Perfect, thank you. Now turning to Jason, the clinical trial itself. So as we think about the 2101 program, the clinical trial opening up in 2024, can you give us a bit of a sense of what's involved between, you know, the IND clearance and actually that first patient treated? I'm happy to. Um, in parallel to all the work that Kelly's going to be doing, getting ready to manufacture for patients, we need to find the right doctors and the right medical centers to treat these patients. So we're in the process of identifying those doctors and those clinical sites. Once we identify them, we then need to train them and make sure that they can deliver this medicine in a consistent and compliant way so that we can generate the data that we need to bring this forward as a potential um, new therapy for patients. Perfect. Thanks, Jason. So last program I'm going to highlight is the NK cell program. And maybe, Kelly, I'm going to turn back to you and start there. The NK cell program is a little bit different than the 1101 and the 2101 programs that are both CAR-T programs, as it's an allogeneic or an off-the-shelf platform. Can you give us a little bit of a sense of what makes, you know, what is an allogeneic? Why is that different and why that's potentially important? Yeah, so with the allogeneic um, process, we, we would be able to have product that's 
ready to go on the shelf. So we'd have inventory of material that's that's available for patients. So that, that does uh, several things. One, number one, it reduces the risk of a manufacturing event for every individual patient. And it also uh, decreases the time uh, between patient identification and the ability to treat that patient because the material is already ready to go. So those are the those are the major benefits that we that we see, and we're really excited about having the opportunity to uh, uh, pursue that technology. Thanks. That's great, Kelly. Elliot, we just announced positive preclinical data for CHM thirteen hundred one, and I know you were excited about it. But maybe you can help us with a little bit more thinking around the development of 1301. Why is it important to Chimeric and, and your view or your thoughts around the data? Sure. Thanks, Jed. So I think CHM 1301 is, is important for a, a number of reasons, but uh, maybe I'll keep it down to about three instead of six or seven uh, this time. Uh, first, uh, CHM 1101, our autologous chlorotoxin CAR therapy, and 0201, our allogeneic and uh, core NK cell therapy, uh, both have uh, great legs for their programs. But we believe there's additional value to be unlocked in the intellectual property from uh, both of those in licensing deals by leveraging the CAR from chlorotoxin and the, the cell uh, starting material for the core NK program. And uh, in terms of the, the benefits this could bring, uh, as Kelly mentioned, uh, this, this could uh, accelerate the time to, uh, to treatment for patients, but also could broaden the, the number of patients who could potentially uh, receive the therapy as, as it could be manufactured at a greater scale uh, with many, many patients uh, worth of material uh, from one manufacturing run. Uh, so this, uh, I think, incredibly exciting. And, and the data from this program uh, so far uh, have been uh, surprisingly um, efficient and, and rapid uh, as we've moved forward with the development of this program. I think they've, they've shown a few really key things. One, our chlorotoxin CAR can work not only in T cells, but also in, in NK cells. It can enhance the killing potential of NK cells beyond uh, what they're able to do on their own. And uh, last, the, the studies that we've announced here have expanded the potential scope of chlorotoxin CAR therapy uh, beyond GBM to include other solid tumor types. Uh, just the, the tip of the iceberg being ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer that we, we looked at in these in vitro studies, uh, but very hopeful that uh, there, there could be additional uh, solid tumor types that could be treated with, uh, with this uh, program as well. Thanks, Elliot. So now that you've got us excited about the 1301 data, Stephanie, maybe you can help us just give us a sense of what do we have to do from where we are today to be able to start to move 1301 into clinic? Sure. So I think we would be building upon the preclinical data that we've already announced with additional preclinical data. And that includes both in vitro and in vivo studies, in vitro being cell culture-based studies using the chlorotoxin NK cells in a tissue culture environment, and then a preclinical studies in vivo in an animal model, a mouse model for a disease that can be treated with our cells. And I think with those two foundation building blocks, we then be ready to go into the clinic. Perfect. Thank you, Stephanie, for that. I think what Stephanie really is, is highlighting is the path from preclinical discovery development into preclinical and through to clinic usually takes a number of years. And so certainly I think this is an asset that we believe to Elliot's point has a lot of potential for the future. It is not one we plan or will be able to see in clinic in the next year. This is something, you know, in preclinical, generally, it'll take a couple of years before you're able to head into clinic. So, you know, this is definitely the backup in the pipeline as the future generation of our assets. So maybe just before we turn it over to any audience questions, I, Jason, I'll just ask you about the recent announcement about the ADVENT AML trial. So, you know, this is the trial at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Texas that is being done as an IIT, it has actually been accepted as an abstract presentation at ASH. Can you just give us a sense? I know you're very excited about this trial, looking forward to it opening up. Maybe you can share with us what that 
excitement about? Yeah, th this is a really unique trial, an opportunity to uh, potentially demonstrate something that could be practice changing. Um, what the team at MD Anderson is working on is taking standard therapy for patients with acute myelogenous leukemia or AML and adding our core NK cells to that standard backbone. And what that does is it provides an opportunity for us to potentially deliver a new combination that includes a cell therapy in the earliest lines of therapy and potentially demonstrate a meaningful benefit over the outcomes that we've seen in patients to date. So they'll be comparing their data that they'll be generating over the next year or so to the data that they've generated in the past. And, and we're really looking forward to, to reporting on, on, on what they're able to see. Perfect. Thank you, Jason. So with that, you know, hopefully what we've been able to do today, although a little bit of a different format, no slides, faces and people actually instead, is give you a bit more of a sense of the expertise and, and certainly the experience that the team here at Chimeric has, why I am so proud of the team that I work with, and give you a sense of where all of these announcements that you've seen over the course of the last few weeks fit into our programs and our future development, and a little bit about what we're expecting and why we're excited. So with that, Matt, I will turn it back over to you to see whether or not there are any audience questions and we'd be happy to answer before we sign off for the day. Thank you, Jen. Yes, as you mentioned, we'll move on to some further Q&A from the audience. Uh, once again, if anyone in the audience does have a question they'd like to submit still, please use the function within Zoom. Uh, Jen, first question is uh, one for you. Uh, you, obviously, the team's together for a strategy meeting of sorts. Can you give the audience some idea of what you're looking to achieve from uh, from this? Yeah, thanks, Matt. I think it's a great question. So I think as many people know, we don't actually have physical offices anywhere. Our team is spread across the United States and me, myself, as many people know, are in, is it, I'm in Toronto, Canada. So generally, once or twice a year, we take the opportunity to come face to face to be able to sit down. And it really gives us a great time and opportunity to be able to talk through what are our priorities, how are we going to actually make those program priorities come to life, what do we need to do to talk about the different strategies and the ways we want to move the programs forward, to explore the different opportunities that we have on the table. And so this is really important time for our team. And so very much what we generally come out of these meetings with is the plan for the next six to 12 months of what we want to achieve and really how we're gonna go about achieving that. Great, thank you. Um, Elliot, I'll direct this one at you. There's been some significant cell therapy deals in recent weeks. Uh, can you provide a bit of detail on this for those unaware and uh, then how that relates back to Chimeric? Sure, thanks, Matt. I, mean, I think even, even going back more than the last couple of weeks, it's been a, a really reassuring uptick in deal flow in the cell therapy space over the last year, uh, I would say. But I mean, just within November, we've seen large deals with upfronts over $100 million US from Novartis, AstraZeneca, uh, Kite Gilead, uh, all on different transactions. And uh, what this means for Chimeric uh, if, if you look at the, the nature of those deals uh, and the assets that are involved in them, they are solid tumor targeted cars, um, early stage cell therapies, and uh, allogeneic cell therapy developers uh, who are the, uh, the leading source of those, uh, those assets in the transactions. So I think this is really um, reassuring. I think it, it demonstrates that Big Pharma is, uh, is continuing to recognize the promise of cell therapy, um, but also is finding ways to, uh, to integrate these very new types of products into their portfolios. Uh, so great question. And, and I think Chimeric uh, with our portfolio is really well positioned uh, at this time based on the types of deals that we're seeing. Thanks, so. Thank you. Uh, another question that's come in is, there's currently two sites listed for the 1101 phase 1B. Will more sites be added and can we expect more second line patients to be enrolled? Yeah, I'm happy to take that one. 
Uh, we do intend to include additional sites, and uh, we do include intend to include patients in the earliest lines of therapy. And a follow up on that was, uh, does the team expect faster data collection and analysis going forward, given the small nature of the data set? And will the transfer of control to Chimerica allow for more slash faster trial updates? Yeah, we're, we're going to continue, as I had mentioned uh, previously, now that it is a Chimeric sponsored trial, we're really in the position to, to drive enrollment and provide updates as frequently as we, we possibly can. That's that's a priority for us. Thanks, Jason. Um, next question that's come through is, has there been any timeline provided in terms of the 0201 and vaccinative trial in AML and CRC? I guess I can take that one as well. Um, so uh, the Bacticerative trial, yeah. Um, so that that is ongoing. It, it's an investigator-sponsored trial at Case Western, and uh, they're continuing to to provide periodic updates, but um, they're still in phase one. Right, and just one more is, is there any potential benefit or synergy when using T-cell and NK cell therapies together? or would the best of them likely be used as monotherapy or in combo with non-cellular therapies? Wow, you've got, I think you've got both uh, Stephanie and Elliot jumping at this. Elliot, do you wanna? Sure, um, I, could, I could take a go. I mean, I think it's, uh, it's a fantastic idea. And I think really an, an unsettled, untested hypothesis at this point, uh, T cells and NK cells do have different functions and, uh, and there is crosstalk within the immune system. So certainly there is a possibility there, but I think uh, the, the practicality or the extent to which uh, that, that could be beneficial uh, would really need to be tested and some data to be generated to see how they could work together. Yep, I agree, Elliot. And I think the obvious next step is the CAR NK cell approach that we're taking as a bridge to that eventual potential combo of T cells. Thank you. Uh, and just a final question, Jen, back to you is, um, can you just talk through the, what significant milestones uh, the company expects over the next six to 12 months? Yeah, of course, Matt, I'm happy to. And maybe I'll take them program by program really based on the discussion we've had here. So starting with CHM 1101, obviously, you know, as Jason said, our commitment to the phase 1B program, it's been initiated. That first patient has been treated. We would we would expect that we will be providing more clinical updates in the future. And as the phase 1A data was positive, looking to move to the expansion cohort in 2024 as well. And so that's what we'll really be looking for is moving forward with the program into the expansion cohorts and providing data as, as we are able to on a regular basis. With CHM 2101, as I'm sure you can guess, the excitement is about getting this into clinic. And so really the key milestone, first and foremost, will be that the clinical trial is open and activated, that first patient gets treated, and by the end of next year, hope to be able to show and announce some clinical trial data on that program as well, the early patients. That again is a chimeric sponsored clinical trial. So we will own and be able to announce as we, as we believe is appropriate in terms of the data sets that we have. And then with the NK program, sort of starting off with the two IITs that are open, the CHM0201 and Vacticertive trial, as Jason mentioned, that is the IIT at Case Western. We do know that that is ongoing and enrolling patients with CRC and AML. And we anticipate that in 2024, we should be able to see some top line data from that trial. And then the second trial that we were talking about is the ADVANT AML trial. And so that is the CHM0201 trial in combination with azacitidine and venetoclax and AML patients. We anticipate that we will see the initiation and the first patient enrolled in that trial at the beginning of 2024. And I think when uh, Dr. Mady actually joined us for the webinar around this trial, he believed that the first cohort of patients would take about nine months to enroll. So we hope that by the end of next year, we'll be able to share some top line data off that trial as well. 
And then obviously with 1301, and so this is what uh, we were just talking about, our chlortoxin CAR and K data that came out, we'll be continuing the preclinical development of that program under the SRA that we have currently with Dr. David Wald at Case Western. And so that's an extremely cost-effective and collaborative program. So we really are pleased to be able to advance the, pro the asset development under that SRA. And just adding to that, we actually will be looking to also develop a car NK using the CDH17 car. So we will have 1301 as the chlortoxin car NK and 2301 as the CDH17 car NK in preclinical development next year. So hopefully a little long-winded, but hopefully that gives everybody a sense of the milestones that we can expect, that everybody can expect to see over the course of 2024. You know, certainly from our perspective, the majority of them are clinically driven and focused. That's really where our priority lays is moving forward all of our clinical development. So we are very excited and anxious to be able to share that data as it comes through with everybody. Great. Thanks very much, Jen. And obviously, thanks to the team for your time and uh, efforts today. I think there was some really good insights for everyone. Um, and thanks again to our shareholders and the audience who just who attended. Um, and we'll look forward to bringing you more in future. But uh, for now, uh, we'll leave it at that. Perfect. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.